Saint Cecilia was born in the late 2nd century, and although the exact date of her birth is unknown, she is one of the most glorious and well-known early Christian martyrs. Her life is an extraordinary example of virtue, and as you will see, her story shows that God can make good come out of all situations, and that his will can be done regardless of how impossible our situation may seem. Cecilia was born in a wealthy Roman family. Christianity was still in the shadows, where mass was held in secret in the catacombs, and being a Christian meant automatic execution. Perhaps the wealth of her family helped protect them from being discovered, but Cecilia was raised in a devout Christian household, and she made a vow of virginity at a young age. From all accounts, her parents did not take well to this, for she was betrothed to a young man named Valerian, despite her vow of perpetual virginity. I am serious, Mama. God's will for me is not to be married. I made a vow of virginity to God, and I will not break that promise. Cecilia, our house will not be shamed by leaving you alone and without a good husband and children. Everything has been arranged. You will marry Valerian at the beginning of this summer. The dowry has been paid, and I will not hear another word from you against this. I haven't even met him. Why do you endanger my faith by betrothing me to a pagan? I asked your father this question, but he is firm in this decision. It is a wealthy house worthy of our name. I will not be marrying him. God will not allow it to happen. God's will is for you to get married, and that is final. As the wedding day approached, Cecilia did much penance, fasted and prayed that she would follow God's will. She saw no other option than following through on her parents' orders, even though getting married would seem to defy everything she had promised to God in her youth. She met Valerian, the man she was to marry, and he was a noble youth of excellent disposition. Cecilia decided that she would offer all her sacrifices to God for Valerian's conversion. The dreaded day of her wedding came, and Cecilia was married to Valerian out of obedience to her parents. However, Cecilia decided that she would not break her vow, no matter what happened, and told Valerian her secret, knowing it would likely result in her arrest and death. Valerian, I have something important to tell you. So soon after our wedding? I made a vow of virginity to God in my youth. I'm a Christian, and I will not break that promise. I married you under obedience to my parents, and I will manage your household, but again I say I will not break my promise. I have an angel of the Lord protecting me and my vow. He is here with us, watching your every move. I don't know what to say. You say you have an angel guarding you. Where is he? Right now, he is standing above you with a flaming sword, and will strike you with a mortal blow if you try to do anything to break my promise. You have an invisible guardian with a sword? Yes. He is about nine feet tall and doesn't seem to like you very much. Do you wish to see my guardian angel? Will that convince you that God wants me to keep my promise? Well, of course. How else am I supposed to believe that he exists? You must travel with me down the Via Appia and be baptized by the Pope in the Christian catacombs. Then you will be able to see him. Valerian and Cecilia traveled down the Roman road, the Via Appia and into the Christian catacombs, where Valerian learned the Christian faith, was truly converted and baptized by the Pope. Y your angel protector is much larger than I imagined him to be, and that sword he carries. 
You have a guardian angel too. Everyone does, even though they often forget that they are there. He is your protector and helper, and is your special friend in times of danger. He protects you more often than you know. Can you ask if it's okay for me to not see him anymore? I still don't think he likes me very much, and he keeps scowling at me and waving that sword in my direction. <laughs> of course. He says that he is still wary that you may still try to make me break my promise. Remember to thank your guardian angel, for he will be your companion in heaven as well. Cecilia and Valerian returned from the catacombs, and Valerian's brother was waiting for them. His name was Tibertius. Valerian couldn't contain his newfound zeal for Christianity, and told his brother all about what had transpired in the days following their wedding. After I was baptized a Christian, I immediately saw the biggest creature I had ever seen standing in front of Cecilia. He looked like a man who was ten feet tall and glowed so brightly I could barely see him. He was crowning Cecilia with a crown of lilies and roses. He then took out a flaming sword and waved it at me. I still don't think he likes me very much, but Cecilia says he put his sword away now and is convinced that I mean her no harm. You have an angel too, Tibertius. What you say is truly astonishing, and if I didn't know you to be an honest man, Valerian, I would arrest you myself. Tell me about this Christian faith. Is it not true that Christians practice abominations? No! That is a lie made up by the emperor so he can go on persecuting our faith. Unleavened bread is offered to God, the priest takes the place of Jesus, says the words of consecration, and the bread turns into the body of Christ. I don't understand. The bread turns into meat? To all outward appearances, it seems to be still bread. It is changed, however, into the body of Christ. Think, Tibertius. The Almighty God disguises himself as a piece of bread and can enter your soul if you convert to Christianity. I am prepared to die for my faith, and I attribute this to the prayers of my wife Cecilia. Tibertius was so impressed by his brother's newfound conviction that he also ended up converting in the end, and was baptized like his brother in the catacombs. The two brothers were struck by the horrors the Christians faced in their persecution, and decided that they would dedicate their lives helping to bury the martyrs killed in their city. It was a very dangerous task, because the Romans knew well that the Christians venerated their dead, and often lay in wait to seize those trying to carry off the Christian remains. Two guards. I think I can see five bodies. The two guards seem to be asleep, but the area is open. The opportunity is just too good. I sense a trap. Alright, I'll see if I can draw them away. You won't have much time. I don't like it. Again, it's just too open. Brother, have faith. We have the prayers of Cecilia on our side, and she promised that her angel would accompany us. Believe me, her angel will take on a few Roman legions. I'll see you back at my house. Eventually, the brothers were caught doing their duty of stealing and burying the Christian dead, and were arrested. Cecilia was arrested as well, and they were brought before the governor. Cecilia and Valerian were together one last time before their sentences were laid down and carried out. Valerian, do not abandon the faith no matter what they do to you. Pray for me that I will not abandon mine. Fear not, Cecilia. I will see you soon in heaven, if God wills it. Valerian and Tiburtius were promptly beheaded, 
sealing their fate as martyrs and saints, singing praise before the throne of God for all eternity. The governor wanted to make an example out of Cecilia, however, and ordered her to be locked in the public baths, and the water heated so much that it would scald her to death. She was locked in and remained for a whole day, and the fires underneath the baths were heated so much, a man could not stand anywhere near them. She is alive, my lord. You lie. It took an hour before a man could enter without getting scolded by the steam. There's no possible way anyone could have lived through that. It would appear she didn't even break a sweat. Here I am, O oh governor. You tried to make an example out of me, but my god made an example out of you. You have no power over me unless the lord wills it. The guard approached Cecilia to cut off her head, and Cecilia gave him no resistance, laying her head on the chopping block herself. However, the guard was seized with a terrible fear, and tried thrice to cut off her head, but he only was able to wound her terribly with these blows. Roman law prohibited an executioner from striking their victim more than three times. For three days, she lay where she was struck, bearing her sufferings patiently. Many Christians and non-Christians alike came to visit her in the night, and it is said that she converted many souls to Christ through her witness. She asked the Pope, who came to visit her as well, to erect a church where her home now stood. After the persecution was over, the church was built, and it is the Church of St. Cecilia's in Rome that is still there to this day. When she died, she was carried to the catacombs and buried, and she remained there until the year 1599, when it was decided that her body was to be moved to the church built in her honor. Your Eminence, you have to come and see this. You have exhumed the remains? It's as if she died yesterday. It looks like she's sleeping, even though she died more than a thousand years ago. Ah, blessed be God. She is incorrupt. Even in death, St. Cecilia was an example of the Catholic faith, and God showed his special love for her in preserving her body throughout the centuries. St. Cecilia is buried in Rome under the high altar at the church dedicated in her honor. She is the patron saint of music and is often pictured playing an organ or a musical instrument of some kind. Her feast day is November 22nd, and her intercession is invoked at the canon of every Mass. Saint Valerian and Saint Tibertius, pray for us. Saint Cecilia, pray for us. On behalf of the Sacred Heart Audio Theater team, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. For more information on upcoming productions or to donate to our cause, visit sacredheartaudiotheater.com. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless you. This is Sacred Heart Audio Theater, bringing saint stories to life for the whole family. Thank you.